April the 1st, 1979, 104 a.m. Got a silent caller to speak. He started to do the heavy breathing bit, so I gave him the usual spiel about what switchboard is all about. I was going to put the phone down, but I could hear he was still there. So I said, please speak to me. And he said, I'm gay. Spoke to him again and said it was great to be gay when he said, I've got to go now, and hung up. Still to this day, we get people calling switchboard um, who aren't able to say anything. And the volunteer uses the methods that are described in this logbook entry and then you'll just hear, I'm gay, or I think I'm a lesbian, or I think I'm trans, and the call ends. And you, as the volunteer, could have been the first person that they've ever said that to. You're listening to The Logbooks, stories from Britain's LGBTQ plus history and conversations about being queer today. In partnership with Switchboard, the LGBT plus helpline. I'm Adam Smith. I'm Tash Walker. The reason that I can walk down the street holding my partner's hand is because of all of the things that were done by the people who've come before me. Thank you. That's a recording from Tash. And I've, just to clarify, my name is Claire Plumley, and I'm um, looking at the archives for Switchboard in Brighton. And Tash, Tash yeah. Walker, yeah. Is, <laughs> is from the London Switchboard. And this is a clip from their podcast, The Logbooks. Now, I got in touch with Tash. I was asked a year or so ago by a for, the former CEO to go to the archives at the Keep, um, where we hold our call logs, to have a look at them, to see whether we wanted to do something with those for our 45th anniversary. And whilst I was thinking this through, I realised that London Switchboard were celebrating their 45th anniversary last year, was it Tash, or the year before? And their media coverage was lovely. They had some lovely stories and beautiful imagery. And when we spoke on the phone, I found out that they were in the process of making these, a series of podcasts from their call logs. And we had such a lovely conversation, a phone chat, that I thought it might be interesting to see and compare where we are, you know, us right at the beginning of our journey and Tash five years on, or maybe a bit more now, I'm not sure. And... Yeah, look at the process of uh, researching the archives and the content. So, Tash, where are you yeah. now? Well, yeah, so, um, gosh, how many years on? So, uh, I suppose, yeah, I'm Tash. Um, I'm one of the co-chairs of Switchboard um, LGBT Plus Helpline. And I first discovered the archive, our logbooks, yeah, I think it was about five years ago now when I was rooting around in the in the very, very messy loft at Switchboard. Um, and I came across these incredible books, these these pa- like papers and pages jam-packed with, you know, you open them and all of this life sort of falls out of the pages. And, you know, I said to Claire when we spoke the first time, it's the best book I've ever read, laughing one minute, crying the next. And I spent about two and a half to three years reading the log books and cataloguing them. So they went from 1974 to 2003. Switchboard took its millionth call in 1986, I think. So there's a lot of log book entries there. And I was just so overwhelmed and touched by, by these written records of volunteers like myself writing down the call records of the people that they helped throughout this period of time, it felt like I was I was seeing my history for the first time. Uh, so I, I just, it was the beginning of my journey. How can I share this? Um, and to cut a very long story short, the idea of creating a podcast which goes directly into your ear, just like those phone calls, incredibly intimate moments in people's lives, and then speaking to people who have those lived memories and integrating that into the themes of the calls and that's where the Logbooks podcast came from. It's such a beautiful way to, to collate all that information. And I think you, I was saying to you before we came on the call, you know, that it's been put together really sensitively. And there's a, a lovely combination of, of history and um, people's personal stories and anecdotes. 
So, so yeah, it's, I think having looked at a few ideas myself as to how we might present uh, these these core logs, it, the podcast seems to work really well as a as a format. But you know, as we were talking about, there are the the ethics, which is something that we're really at the beginning of thinking about. This has been a real conundrum for for us at Brighton Switchboards. It's, so yeah, we want you to know that you're safe. Okay, so as a helpline, we're here to support. And we're here very much in the in the background, and we want you to feel safe to call. That's the whole purpose of, of what we provide. And so there was there's a sensitivity around revealing some of the content of the call logs because they're anonymized and they're also they're held at the keep. And if you want access to them, you have to ask the CEO, a switchboard, and the board. So it's they're not open to the public. But still, you know, there's been lots of discussion around the sensitivity of the nature of the calls and we wouldn't want anyone to feel like we were just opening up these these stories that might reveal information about, about people that they don't want revealed, understandably. So today I'm going to be sharing some kind of like some outlines of what the, the kinds of paperwork that I've found, mostly from the 1980s, and some snippets, which I think are kind of shit, safe to share. But also really interested to find out what you think, you know, in the breakout rooms about how much we could and should and shouldn't share and, you know, whether we can redact information and that's okay. Um, but yeah, it's, it's complicated and we're still talking it all through. And um, you've, you've, obviously you've talked about it as well, Tash, your considerations. It might be different because you're in London and we're in Brighton and Brighton's a smaller place and that kind of makes it a little bit more, I don't know, sensitive maybe, but... Yeah, I think it is a, it is different. We So Switchboard, although it started in London, it took calls from all across the UK um, and still does today. So, you know, we take, we've take we taken millions and millions and millions of calls throughout our period of time in uh, in our 46 years now. We've taken calls from within London and you know London is a much larger city than Brighton as you say just as a starting point but we were taking calls from all across the country um, from you know Scotland Northern Ireland England Wales and outside of the UK too so the number of entries are are very very large ethics is such a an, you know it's something that's so important and it's at the root of everything that we that we do that confidentiality that safe space that we provide that is the priority that and the emotional well-being of our volunteers so what what can we do that's safe here? So when I was going through the logbooks and in the process of producing the beginnings of season one of the podcast, what we did is we looked at the themes. What were the main themes that were coming out of here, out of this period of time that we focused on? So the first period was 1974 to 1982, and we collated like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of logbook entries, picking a couple or so of them, removing any identifying details, location, name, place, but because of the nature of Switchboard, we can change those identifying details to being from Plymouth to um, Perth in Scotland, and it's still relevant. So we have a lot more flexibility on that side. But we really were collating the most common calls, really, and highlighting what people were reaching out to Switchboard about. And then we added in this additional layer to explain those personal stories you know, in more detail. And that was speaking to people who had either called Switchboard, who volunteered for Switchboard, or who just have lived memories of those different themes, like housing, for example, which is one of the episodes in season one. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's very interesting to think about how the lens is, is something that I've been thinking about a lot with how, what, I sele what I've selected, what is, you know, I've, I've documented, I've digitized some of these so that in Switchboard, they've got an easy access, uh, easy access to some of these calls. And I started off looking at, the Feb February the 9th is a kind of because that's the date that Switchboard Brighton started and that was suggested to me by by Lindsay who was the CEO before and um but I found that the calls were a bit dull on that date so I went through them and it's kind of what well, that wasn't working and there are so many issues and political events to pick up on that in a small amount of time I found it really hard to work out what to focus on and I think it helped me when I went to the archives with um, Sharon Webb and Rachel Thompson from University of Sussex who are doing research on 
um, marginalised communities' archives, and they picked up on the elements of care and in the archives and the conversations that were happening between the volunteers and lots of nuances in there, which which made me realise that it's really good to to look at archives with other people as well because you get different perspectives and it helped me not because I'm not a historian I'm a community worker and I've and I've done museum education so it's I'm not going in as a as an historian so what do we take from an archive as an individual and I suppose as a community worker I am interested in that what is happening between the individuals and how they leave notes for each other and you know those all those little relationships that are happening behind the scenes which are hidden are fascinating to me um it's difficult to share those necessarily but there may be a way i'm not sure so yeah in terms of the the emo you know the kind of how are what is it like to be in an archive with this stuff the keys i found really exciting because it kind of get it, I wanted to know where those keys were from. You know, it's 1986. This is a question for the breakout room. If anybody knew where the office was in 1986, I'd love to know. We can use the keys. We can let ourselves in, have a party. Maybe not now. But, um, you know, it's that your imagination starts to, you know, to start working. And there is that kind of... The, what do you feel when you're in the archive? You talk, we talked about the stacks of clean paper, you know, say one year I found, 1982, I think it was, was like pristine and like you said, like untouched. And you're like, okay, nobody's touched these archives before. The year before was kind of all dog-eared and, and then at the keep, the archivist was getting excited because she brought one lot out. She goes, look, they're pink this year. And then they were yellow the next year. And it's like somebody had changed their, you know, like somebody changing their shirt. And there are all those lovely kind of hidden decisions, you know, that are sort of relevant to the people who are making them and indicate their care as well, that they want to make them pink or yellow. And, you know, um, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Just looking at that slide there and just, you know, the keys, they're so worn and that crumpled uh, tag. Just imagine how many pockets that's been in. It's just amazing. This is what the archive does. It brings that history to life with these tangible objects. You know, the idea of picking and holding those keys up and all of those people for the last 45 years. Well, no, not 45 years, but, you know, however long those keys are in existence. It's so alive. It's amazing. Yeah, it is. It's fascinating. OK, I think maybe it's time for our first slide of the uh, call logs. Right. OK, so I can share this because there's oh, it's just well, I'm going to read out what it says because some of you may not be able to see. I'm not going to read out everything on each slide. But on the right-hand side, there are a series of categories. This is from 1987. And it's the categories are clubs, pubs, um, GCO. I'm not sure what that is. Um, accommodation, tourist accommodation, food, gay societies, hoax, health. So yeah, hoax is you know so common that they've listed it. Um, jobs, befriending advice and counselling, legal, message for switchboards, new info, publications, saunas, religious, sex, TV, TS, massa, regular call, personal call. So that already gives an indication of you know the the common types of call, um, which could be a starting place for us in itself to to investigate if we're if we're not comfortable with sharing too much information beyond that but this one's quite I, this one was worth sharing because it's um i love the the repartee between volunteers so it's 8:50 there's a call it says keys on which side and when do you wear keys don't know rang okay i'm going to insert name here tom who said not to bother, because I can't put the proper name in, can I? The real names anyway, so I'm going to make up names, okay? Um, so rang Tom, who said not to bother. Star by it. Underneath there's another star, says, left, active, right, passive, so I understand, exclamation mark. Thanks, Rob. Um, so yeah, and Tash, you've got another one that kind of absolutely. When Claire showed me this um, slide, uh, I just it just jump it just reminded me so much of this slide that I found from uh, 1976, the handkerchief code. It was the uh, the left um, and then the right, 
Uh, it's absolutely amazing. It's such a fantastic, um, you know, handwritten by the volunteers for the volunteers. You know, all these notes in the margins. So much of the logbooks is conversation between the volunteers, and it makes you realise that this is actually there. You know, the the switchboards, Brighton and London, they were they were a character in their own in their own right, and they were made up of all these volunteers. But they have this personality, which is so wonderful. And there's there's, I mean, it's brilliant. You can you can maybe see some of it here. On we've got um, black. Um, if you were on the left hip pocket, so this is butch and sadistic, you were a whipper. And if you were on the right, what else? A whippy, passive and masochistic. It's just um, it's just amazing. My particular favourite, which turned out to be Claire's as well. If you scroll sort of halfway down, puce. Um, so if it's on the left hip pocket, unlimited, but want to discuss pre-Columbian art first. And, and, on, <laughs> and on the right, uh, looking for a discussion in pre-Columbian art. And it's just so, it's just wonderful to capture this. I'd heard so much about the handkerchief, hanky code, handkerchief code, but just to see it there in writing from 1976, it's just a wonderful, wonderful history. And there's, I mean, there's a lot of humour in these archives, but obviously there's, there are, I mean, you know, we, we sit there and we would laugh out loud. I mean, you'd laugh out loud at some of the things in there, but then you, you, you go from the laughing to the crying, like you said before, and the... There are some extremely challenging issues that that come up and that we we receive us we're reading them you know it's not always easy reading and something that really st stood out for me is this letter from the eighth of February in nineteen eighty five and it's amongst all the the call logs this this letter just sort of kind of fell out and it because you've got all the the templates and what was interesting to me about this is that somebody had typed this out separately okay it could have been written in the log but I'm going to read it so it says supplement to call 8 15 on Friday the 8th of February 1985 this call was from dash a friend of mine about a friend of hers who earlier in the day had been diagnosed by his GP as having AIDS on Monday, he went to the GU clinic for more information. At the clinic, he learnt that he does not have AIDS. He does, however, have an incompetent GP who cannot tell the difference between being antibody positive and having the full-blown syndrome. Whilst he is obviously very relieved that he does not have anything wrong with him that he did not already know about, he's also understandably feeling XXX, particularly XXXX, angry that he was forced to go through a horrendous weekend of doubt and worry because his XXX GP's stupidity. And it's the anger that comes through in this letter and the frustration and the X's where that, that really indicates the anger to me. And the importance of this issue to this particular volunteer that it needs to go on a separate piece of paper felt really significant to me in and yeah that was that was quite a find um and Tash you've got a lot of finds from this period as well yeah totally it's it's an incredibly complicated period of time and when we've spoken about it before Claire one of the things that we always come back to is that you know these are members of the LGBT community supporting themselves supporting themselves each other as well as the callers and the community and it's you know reading that now that um, the emotion is still so raw and fresh you can you can feel the 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 like the ferociousness in which it was typed the anger that was behind that you can you can see that in that entry um it is it's a, it's an incredibly emotive period of time so much happened so much happened to the lgbt community they were you know the media was outrageous wider society um and also within the community as well, it was a it was a really uprooting period of time. Um, but yeah, in the, in the switchboard logbooks, it, it it covers a lot of this. And in the the season two of the podcast, which is coming out um, tomorrow, it uh, it covers this period of time, and we we really focus a lot on HIV and AIDS. So if we have a look at the next slide here, um, I've got an example from um, the switchboard logbooks. So I'll I'll uh, read this out. Um, caller. XYZ has had AB positive test results with no counselling at all. Had his lover die of AIDS three weeks ago. Wouldn't talk to me, but knows my name. Called at 4.13am on the 8th of March. Hence this incoherent scribble. 
He could call back at any, in capitals and underlined, time. Please be gentle. He's scared stupid, knows the hard facts and is in desperate need of coping. This entry really just, it just jumped out to me because it's one of so many that are so similar. It's that lack of pastoral care and, you know, uh, responsibility from the medical profession. They didn't understand what was going on. The switchboards were the first point of contact for so many when they found out about this because they were the ones collecting the most up-to-date information. The community was, you know. And in this, um, in this entry, there's one line that really jumped out to me and we've named one of the episodes after it. Please be gentle, he's scared, stupid. And it, that's just just resonates so much um, for me, especially with, with the HIV and AIDS crisis at this period of time in the 80s through to the 90s, where switchboards like London and Brighton and so many others really were supporting people in really desperate times. So the next um, couple of slides are, are the, the log sheet for police incidents and... These are very detailed. I'm not going to write. I'm not going to read out everything on this. But the thing that that jumped out to me was first of all, I, at the top of the page is what I really like is do not push this section if the caller is obviously too upset. Fill in as many of the details as possible after you finish the call. And on the back of the sheet, it reiterates the completion of this log sheet does not take precedence over helping the caller. And again, that's kind of like the emphasis is on listening and hearing what people have to say and not filling in the paperwork. And, and, but the thing that obviously is potent about this piece of paperwork is that incidents with the police were so common that they have a piece of paperwork for it. Tash, you have a series of, you one of your um, podcasts was called Pretty Policeman. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Pretty Policeman. Um, and I've got a clip that we'll play in a second, but just before we do that, I think it's important to acknowledge that when these, when our switchboard started, part of the reason it started was off of the partial decriminalisation of homosexuality in 67 and this sort of emerging underground queer scene that we would now say gay scene maybe then started to come out, which made visibility slightly more prescient. And all of those people very rarely were convicted. Well, although you were, you did have people convicted pre-67, but post-67, the police reaction was horrible. And it was just raids and arrests and just, you know, undercover policemen. That's where the pretty policeman comes from. It was it was really, really strong victimisation of our communities from the police. Um, and in Switchboard's logbooks, we used to uh, tell people how to deal with the rest um, because the chances of you being arrested were very high. And one of the things that we would say was that you should always get in contact with a solicitor, David Offenbach, who we managed to find. This is something that uh, you highlighted to me, Claire, as part of your archive, um, looking into the different areas that people might be contacting about. And one of them was custody. And that's something that we found a lot in the switchboard log books around um, women losing custody of their children. And that's something I didn't know an awful lot about I'd heard about you know men having sex with men being arrested um for importuning but I had not heard about the real um challenges that women had lesbian bisexual and gay women had throughout this period of time in the battle for their rights for their children um so should we hear that audio clip now on that log entry September the 24th 1975 and the volunteer was uh, Alaric a woman rang to ask if I knew anything about the case of a woman who was living with another woman who was refused custody of her child, in spite of medical evidence that the child would have been better off with mother. This was for a case on now, very similar, which she wanted the info to help her with. Said, ring back Angela, just in case you know anything about this case or any other. Also sent her to Sappho. P.S. Just realised I didn't ask which side she was on. Probably the mother's. <laughs> it was one year when Women's Own put the switchboard phone number in its diary and suddenly we started getting calls from married lesbians who were literally sneaking downstairs at one or two in the morning to phone us while the family was asleep and they knew that they were lesbians quite often they were in love with the woman next door or something like that or their best friend or whatever and they had agreements that they would not tell their husband 
or leave their husband until the kids had grown up and left. Um, because lesbians never got custody of their kids in those days, for starters. Either the kids would go to the father, or if he didn't want them, they'd actually go into state care, because lesbians were thought to corrupt their kids. And gay men who left their wives wouldn't get any form of access either. So they were literally just waiting to be able to come out until it would not destroy the family. I ended up going to court and having to battle for custody for my son, which was very difficult. And I had to go to the Strand in London, which was daunting. But it was something that I did very much on my own. Even though my brother was gay and lots of my friends were gay, his friends, coming out myself was such a different journey. I think that's mostly because I had a son. Fortunately for me, I was a low earner at the time, so I had legal aid. So I got probably the best brief in London on legal aid. She fought for me to keep custody of my son. It was a very difficult time, I have to say. If any time I've had a difficulty in my life, I just think, look what happened there. On the back of that legal call sheet from 1980, in addition to custody of children, there are other categories such as arranged marriages. Actually, I did find one or two calls around arranged marriage in the logs. Um, there's also blackmail, housing and squatting, libel and slander, TV or TS, immigration and foreigners, which brings me on to language as well, which can cause a bit of discomfort when we're reading through because it's so different to the use of language now. Uh, for instance, there's a log sheet from 1980 in which both Rock Against Racism, an event, is flagged up at 9pm and then at 9.20 there's this uh, this log included, which says, Persian sounding creep, extremely abusive, calls twice, likes to think of us as queer bastards, not very original. Which seems like an interesting juxtaposition in relation to anti-racism intent versus perhaps some internalised racism emerging when anger takes over. Yeah, this is a, another piece of paperwork template that we... That we um, that I found, and mainly from 1977. So they're some of the earliest ones that I came across, and I can't. The the level of detail is so. There's so much detail in in some of these befriending summaries, which is fascinating. Um, and one of them kind of contains a a situation where two young men were in. They actually came into the office, and. They were living together, but were too young. They were under one of them was under the age of consent, and so they were really concerned about the the police. The police had, had just come into their flat without a warrant because of some family issue that was unconnected to their their relationship status. But they were terrified that they were going to get found out for for living together and what police might find because they'd taken their keys without permission. And so anyway, they call this. And this was about 11.15 at night, um, so it's late, you know, the caller is staying, the, the operator was staying later, and he called a solicitor down, there was a solicitor living downstairs, who he called, like, just on the off chance that he could give them um, advice, and in the morning there was this, like, this, this, this note afterwards which said, yeah, called, uh, let's call him David, called David downstairs last night, he gave us some advice, spoke to him this morning, but he was too pissed to remember what he said, which was kind of like, <laughs> he was just, so it's kind of like the, all these informal relationships that are there, which, you know, we wouldn't, in, in 1977, there's an informality about the nature of some of these kind of befriending situations and the legal advice I'm not. I'm not suggesting that that all legal advice was under the influence of alcohol, but um, it's there were in terms of safeguarding and boundaries and things that we would kind of be concerned about now, where people were meeting and how they were meeting and whether they're meeting in a pub or at somebody's house. It's very different to how we would do things now. But then, having spoken to a member of the board, 
it was different then and the the dividing lines between professional and um client or no participants or people that were supported were, were much more blurred than they were now I mean it's still something that comes up in discussion as being a community worker and part of the community but it's it's an interesting kind of um area to to look into I think in, in terms of the, the closeness of the community and and how it's so different to how how we work now in a professional context and they were very responsive, the callers. So from what I saw in the 1980s, a woman started to come on on a Thursday night, every Thursday night in response to female callers. And they had a, a trans operator, I'm calling them operators because that's what they call them in the logs. Um, Tash calls them volunteers, I think. And so, yeah, they had a, a trans operator on the last Friday of the month. And there's indication in another call log of them calling London Friend to find out what support there was for, for the trans community and how they run meetings and trying to find solicitors who are sympathetic and uh, doctors who are sympathetic to the trans community. So, um, yeah, Tash. Yeah, it's so interesting looking back through the logbooks um, in the 70s and 80s and 90s as well. There's one thing that really strikes me is that you know, like you, you highlighted already this um, archaic language of TV and TS, transvestite, transsexual being the way that people use to describe um, to describe the callers. Um, and, I, and it really struck me um, when looking through the logbook entries and on reflection that we've always had calls from transgender and gender non-conforming people. But we as a society and as a community did not have the language to be able to identify that, nor did they always have the language to be able to highlight that as, as what they were calling for or how they were feeling. So, yes, there is an, a much higher rate of people who are transgender and gender nonconforming now reaching out in, you know, in 2020 to to the switchboards. Um, but that's also with the caveat that they have the language to be able to explain how they feel and to explain their identity, which we didn't have in the 70s and the 80s. Um, so it's always something that I'm you know, really fascinated about. And when we were making season one of the podcast, we spoke to transgender people about you know, their experiences in that period of time. And they're so varied from people who are fully accepted, had a, had a wonderful transitioning experience to others who had the complete opposite of that. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting part of, of, of our history, especially because it's starting to see the move away from this very binary lesbian and gay world as well. I thought we might end on a lighter note. And Tash has got a lovely poem to read out as well. So the next slide, please, is a fave of mine. Um, for those of you who can't see it. So it says... Boys wanting lesbian for sex told him about lesbians not needing boys. Shocked. So yeah, nice. There, there are so many logbook entries from uh, callers which do, which do just make you laugh. Uh, I remember reading one um, in around the 80s as well from a boy who absolutely loved erasure and just wanted to be everything like the lead singer. So he was calling Switchboard to ask how he could become gay. Um, which is just so, it's just so wonderful. Um, but the, yeah, uh, Claire mentioned um, a poem that I found in the log books. Uh, this is a Valentine that was uh, given to us over the phone by a caller um, to, to London Switchboard. So I, I'll read it for you now. Roses are red, violets are blue. Some like bright in Bristol, I like you. Sitting there hours on end, helping those who cannot fend for themselves in this cold land, giving them a helping hand. Voices soft, assuring warm, make us feel so safe from harm. Information gay galore, with all that talent you're bound to score. Roses are red, violets are blue, some like gay news, I like you. <laughs>